Hello, I'm late to the game on this one, but finally getting around to Apple's 140 watt, 96 watt, and 67 watt USB C power adapters. Apple has struggled to put up good numbers in these tests, so we'll have to see if these, already not so new, power adapters fare. In this series, I try to answer the question, which power adapter do I want to get? The videos get technical, so hang on and always ask questions if you don't understand something. The performance is measured and compared to near competitors to see how each one stacks up. If you want to help out the channel, see the links on my webpage or in the description. Patreon is now live as well as the super button. Thanks to my current patrons. First, let's get these power adapters opened up and see what we've got. The packaging is Apple simple for these power adapters. Cardboard boxes, and less plastic than most. Opening up the 67 watt box, we get the peel the thing, slide the tray out, very Apple. The box has a power adapter and a bunch of paper. Much more than most people include these days, but I guess Apple wants you to read. Warranty card, FCC compliance card, and the user manual, which is about as simple as it gets. But it's a one port USB-C power adapter. You plug it in and go, right? The 96 watt is very similar. Really, it's identical. I may have had some user difficulty getting the adapter out of the tray, but I don't think I can blame Apple for that. The user manual on this one has a little less information since they don't tell you the input current rating for the device. I think we get the point here though. On to the adapters. Apple has a nice sleek design here with the glossy white plastic housings. The major issue I have with these is they're crazy dust magnets. The 67 watt adapter, as all of these do, has one USB-C port. The logo and model number are on one side and all of the juicy logos and other stuff are on the other side. Here we can see the UL, Canada, and US safety listing as well as the DOE 6 mark for efficiency. This adapter does have several marks for other countries' safety listings as well. The power adapters do have a universal plug thing in the corner, so different country plugs or extension cables can be attached to these adapters. The manufacturer of this adapter appears to be light on. The 96 watt adapter is extremely similar. Same port, a bit larger, and the logo arranged on one side is a little different, but the same information is present. Here, we can see the current rating of 1.5 amp for this adapter. This adapter is manufactured by Flextronics. Safety listing and efficiency marks are both present and welcome. The 140 watt adapter, which is to my knowledge the first 140 watt PD 3.1 capable adapter, is also the same. Single, but much more power capable output port. This adapter is also manufactured by Flextronics. The addition on this adapter is the capability of the 28 volt extended power range output mode. Here are the weights for these adapters. The packaging for the 67 watt adapter weighs 52 grams. The power adapter weighs 207 grams. The 96 watt packaging weighs 60 grams. The power adapter weighs 302 grams. The 140 watt packaging weighs 65 grams. The power adapter weighs 280 grams. Interesting that the higher wattage adapter is lighter. Here are the three power adapters together with the Anchor 140 watt and Anchor 65 watt GAN Prime adapters. You can see the major size difference here. The Apple adapters are quite large by comparison and also heavier. The 140 watt Anchor is smaller than the 67 watt Apple adapter. I can start to see why Apple is recommending third party chargers. The competition is real. These power adapters all have the same output modes with the exception of one adapter. The power adapters all have fixed output voltages of 5, 9, 15, and 20 volt power delivery 3.0 modes. They all specifically lack the PPS or variable output voltage mode. So these are the wrong choice if you expect to fast charge a Samsung phone. These devices aren't all equal though. The current level changes as you step up in watts. So the 67 watt can do about three amps in the 20 volt mode. The 96 watt can do about five amps and the 140 watt can also do five amps. This is where the power delivery 3.1 extended power range comes in. A USB cable, see my video series on USB cables for more detail, has to be able to carry the current and has a real world resistance. Therefore, it has losses. The current really can't be pushed higher with the USB-C connector and the cables, so something has to give. Well, PoE has been around for a while and it pushes the voltage up to 48 volts over tiny wires. Enter the USB power delivery 3.1 specification, which adds some new fixed voltage modes called extended power range or EPR. These allow for voltages of 28, 36, or 48 volts to push the power level up to 140, 180, or even 240 watts over existing connectors with no additional loss in the wiring. It does require a special chip in the device, the charger, and the cable to make this work. Of course, I have all those things to make 140 watts reality here in the lab. The 140 watt adapter has the 28 volt 5 amp mode to deliver the full 140 watts of output power on one port. The overload test on all these adapters was conservative. The 67 watt adapter went the furthest with an overload threshold of 77 watts. The 96 watt adapter is already at its limit apparently because 97 watts was all it did. The 140 watt adapter stopped at 143 watts. All can deliver the rated power while staying cooler than the typically much smaller power adapters from the competition though. The devices all stay within the basic requirements of the USB power delivery specification for DC output voltages. 
As expected, the 96 and 140 watt devices have power factor correction, but the choice of how to use that power factor correction is hindered by design, as we have seen from some manufacturers. Power factor correction is the technique to consume the least AC current for the equivalent power level. This means less loss in other components like wiring and transformers. We can see some different implementation in these various devices though. The 67 watt altogether doesn't bother, as is typical for this power level. The 96 watt gets very stingy with its power factor not turning on until 41 watts. It is amazing how much less current is required when the power factor turns on with this device. It is already there, use it. The 140 watt adapter is a little better and it turns on the PFC in all but the 5 volt mode. Here you can see it on and off at 15 watts switching between the 5 volts and 9 volt mode. This is much like the anchor method. Once full load is achieved, the graphs is not quite perfect. There are a few spikes on it, but it flattens out up on the top. 67 watts, 65 watts, 66 watts. The category bounces around a bit, but they all have one thing in common. They generally skimp on features at this power level and don't offer what can be offered in terms of clean AC current. This adapter starts out great with good idle performance, but as soon as you use power from it, it gets bad. The real power efficiency is good, but it does this while making noise and moving extra current around on the AC line. 4.6 peak amps under full load, making this one of the worst I have seen. The 96 watt adapter is a tale of two adapters. It switches on that PFC circuit around 41 watts, which makes it suddenly turn from not nice to nice. The ability to do this sooner is obviously within Apple's toolbox, as we will see in moments with the next adapter. Idle is also good on this adapter. The efficiency when working with the PSA is among the best in the industry. So when this power adapter is fully loaded, it is one of the best, but sadly, most of the time, with an idling modern computer, it will be under that 41 watt mark. The 140 watt adapter is a step in the right direction. The idle power consumption is good. The power adapter does lack the PFC in the five volt mode, but only this mode. It is very similar to how Anchor handles things. I'm not sure who is copying who at this point, but maybe one of them will stop copying and start innovating. The 140 watt adapter is an early version of this technology though, and it shows in the power performance numbers that it is not as good as some of the competition out there as of now. The comparison puts Apple in the usual spots, towards the bottom for active power and decent for idle performance. The 67 watt is well, not great since it trades noise for efficiency. The 96 watt has the technology but chooses not to use it half the time. Actually, the number considering this is quite high. Like I said, this is industry leading for 96 watts out. The 140 watt adapter actually does much worse than it should considering it mostly has PFC on. When compared with the direct anchor competitor, it loses. On the idle graph, the Apple adapters are relatively clean and don't use a lot of power, though none of the power adapters on this chart are bad, so we don't have any outliers to demonstrate bad here. On the average power consumption graph, the alternating current power quality of the these devices takes the lower spots. The 67 watt, this is one of the worst ever tested. The 97 watt gets the middle value since it is both great and terrible at the same time. The 140 watt tries harder but misses the mark in general. Apple's 67 watt adapter is not my choice. If you need to get one port, I would have to give the win to the Anchor Nano 2 65 watt, which still isn't amazing, but at least it's better. The adapter has a bunch of safety listings, which is great. The build quality is high, and the price point is about $60, which is not totally insane pricing for what it does. You can do better though. The idle power puts it within the reach of the DOE 6 efficiency rating for both idle and active power. I still can't say go with this one though. The 96 watt adapter is an interesting device. If you're going to go bananas and only fully load this device, then it is an excellent choice. Just don't use it at low power. It has the safety listings, the build quality is high, and it meets the required efficiency standards. It would be nice if the PFC could be turned on a little earlier since this could be the chart topping power adapter, but no such luck purely based on decisions. At $79, it is expensive, but not out of line with Apple's other offerings. The 140 watt is now already kind of old. It is showing its age, both with its larger size and weight in comparison with other offerings. It is, however, still reasonably efficient and capable as long as you keep it out of that five volt mode. It's not a phone charger, it's a laptop charger. The power adapter still has all the requisite safety listings and meets the DOE 6 efficiency requirements. At $99, there are competitive options that are better or equal. In conclusion, these power adapters are doing what Apple does, providing a quality product that doesn't push any envelopes and stays far off the radar of state of the art. They will last a long time and in the long run, even if they are cost a few dollars more, they might save you a few dollars versus having to buy two adapters. None of these topped any charts, 
but the best of the bunch is the 140 watt adapter. These adapters stayed cool during testing and all carried US and Canada safety listings, plus others. The voltage levels look good, but these do lack certain modes like PPS. So not the best choice if you need to charge many different devices. Time to apply the stickers. These are tested and on the database. Search for Apple on the pqs.app page to find out that more have been tested already. Compare them all. Thanks for watching. Next week, the plan is to put some US store brand insignia adapters to the test. There is a calendar on the website linked in the description of upcoming videos, so check it out. I have many more of these power adapters to get through, so many more videos in the future, including three more PD 3.1 adapters. Thanks again, and bye.